Good evening, and welcome to the fifth episode of The Wide World of Wayne. I'm Wayne Viner. On the phone is Cordell Woodland. I'm at the Viner Fourgate Studios in Rockville. Cordell, as usual, at the CBS Radio Studios in Baltimore. How are things tonight, Cordell? Not bad, Wayne. How's it going? It's going okay. How late did you stay up last night with the Nats? Oh, man, pretty late, actually. Uh, I was actually at the Midnight Mile at Maryland, and I was able to get back and watch the last two innings uh, outside once it was over. Okay, I'll start with the Midnight Mile then. Uh, how many kids showed up? It was over 1,000 announced. Uh, uh, Coach Turgeon said it was the most that they had had uh, in the recent years, so that was pretty good. It was definitely a nice showing. They had a... A lot of gift giveaways, free pizza, T-shirts. So it was a uh, it was a good uh, get together for all the students at, at Maryland. All right. Did you run in it? I didn't run. <laughs> I didn't run. I stretched. I was a game time decision. <laughs> and uh, at the last second, it was just uh, we'll we'll watch from the side. Okay, that's that's a wise wise move. <laughs> so the Nats, even though I'm not a Nat because I'm an Oriole. By the end of the game, I was rooting for the Nats to win cause, <clears throat> because so many people I know are, are passionate about this. I still don't understand that because I grew up as an Oriole. Were you an Oriole and you're now a Nat, or what's your baseball affiliation? That's exactly what it was. I had no choice growing up but to be an Oriole fan. Uh, so I was around for the Rafael Pomero, Kyle Ripken, Brady Anderson and Mike Mustaine all that time. Uh, but when the Nats came to D.C., it was an instant switch, man. It was, it, it just happened so easy. Uh, and I think it happened for the, for the entire area that way. The, the, the switchover happened pretty smooth. Um, so this has been a long time coming for Nats fans. You know, they've had, we've had plenty of heartbreak uh, dealing with the Nats in postseason up until this point. But Man, they saved their best for this year. Uh, Howie Kendrick's coming through with the clutch, with the clutch grand slam after making countless amount of errors this season. It's been a terrible series for him overall. But this has been the Nats all year, honestly, to come from behind wins and uh, the late game rally. So this is a team that doesn't quit fighting. They can score a lot of runs, and they showed it last night. Well, I feel blessed to root for the Orioles and their 55 wins, the Redskins, and, well, there's zero wins, and Maryland football, which has been a really up-and-down experience for my whole life. I know how to pick them, but at least the Caps won. So, hey, i got to give them that. So, yeah. yeah, at least the Caps got it done recently. Yep, so the football Terrapins, 3-2, and two, and we talked a little bit about the Rutgers game on the last episode. Head over to Purdue. Uh, West Lafayette, Indiana, I decided not to go. It just I was in Chicago last week. I was at the Rutgers game. I had the holiday on Wednesday. Just too much going on. Uh, the one and four Purdue Boilermakers, they were looked at at one point as a breakout team, and then everybody got hurt. And, right. look, they've got a redshirt freshman quarterback. Rondell Moore, their superstar, their Stephon Diggs, isn't even on the depth chart. So when people ask, do you think he's going to play? All I can tell you is he's not even listed on the depth chart anymore. So my feeling is no. Um, anything going on in the studio? Any any chatter about Maryland football this week? Well, it's kind of the same sim uh, situation as it was last week right now. Everybody thinks that this is a game Maryland uh, should win, and they need right now. Uh, with the Big Ten being as competitive as it is. So, yeah, Purdue is a tough place to play, and it is their homecoming, so they can't be overlooked. Uh, but talking to the guys uh, on Tuesday, um, it doesn't sound like this is a game that they overlooked. It sounds like, you know, they're getting back to locking in a little bit, and the offense is going to look a little bit different now with Piggy starting. You know, uh, Josh Jackson having an ankle injury from last week, Piggy gives them a little bit more mobility, and that's what the guys were talking about uh, when I talked to guys like Anthony McFarlane and Javon Leak on Tuesday, uh, asking them what the difference was between Piggy and Josh Jackson running the offense. And they both said that he just Piggy's ability to extend plays uh, just 
gives them a higher percentage for the home run ball, which we see Maryland depends on. Maryland is a team of home run scoring. Um, they yeah. seem right now to, to be either 80 yards or one yard on a carry. And it, it, that's something that bothers Loxley. Sometimes I think the Terps score too fast. They've had several one-play drives, two-play drives, kickoff returns. But when you're scoring close to 50 points a game when you're on, that's not a problem. But look, Maryland fell asleep in Philadelphia, pretty much slept through the Penn State game, and dozed through the first quarter of that Rutgers game, and suddenly they woke up again. I don't think it's all attributable to the change of the quarterbacks because Maryland had, I believe, a 20 seven to seven lead at halftime um, when Jackson got hurt. So they'd scored some with Jackson, but it just continued into the second half. And as a Maryland fan, it's good to see the home run hitters hit the home runs. I have been to the only two times Maryland's ever played Purdue. I got to go to both of the games. First one was December 29th, 2006. We went down to Orlando, Maryland wins with Sam Hollenbach at quarterback, 24-7 to in the Champs Sports Bowl. And then it was in College Park on November 10th, 2016. Uh, Maryland wins 50-7. to Actually, I believe that was October 1st, 2016. Maryland wins 50-7 to at home. Uh, I really think Purdue's too beat up to really put up the type of fight that they'd like to. Um, they have right. problems at the left tackle, at the right tackle. They have linebackers out. They have defensive linemen out. The star wide receivers out. The starting quarterbacks out. They have more injuries than the Redskins do. It's yeah. it, it's just horrible what's happened there, and they weren't the deepest team to begin with. One of the cool things, you said it's homecoming. It's the 97th homecoming for Purdue. Right. They do have a winning record on homecoming, 51, 41, and four ties. And they're wearing some really cool uniforms. I saw them on Twitter. It's called the Cradle of Astronauts because so many astronauts went to Purdue. And uh, yeah, take a look. The game will be on BTN, as is most Maryland games. But I do have to look ahead. I stopped looking ahead after the Penn State game. So just win the game we're going to play. Let's just beat Purdue. But next week... It's Indiana, and we get a 3.30 game. Can you believe we're not playing at noon? I can't, honestly. Uh, I really can't. And is that homecoming week? Uh, no. We Maryland? get – no, no, no. We get an easy game for homecoming. We get Michigan. Right. That's a joke. <laughs> the Indiana game yeah. is – see, I do have some notes, but I don't have exactly what, what's going on. It's probably parents' weekend for Indiana, 3.30 game. Um, then Maryland has, they're at Minnesota. I'm heading out to Minneapolis for that. Then we have right. Michigan at home. And, and then it gets easier. We get Ohio State, Nebraska, and Michigan State. So it, it's, you got to win the games you can win. If, right. if you get a win on Saturday, that gives you four, you're four and two, you beat Indiana. And once again, here I am looking ahead, so I'm just going to stop it. But you could get to six. It's not out of the question. Definitely not. That's what makes this game so key. Uh, because looking at the schedule, honestly, this is maybe their last gimme game, if that's what you want to call it, uh, with Purdue being as banged up as they are. And this is the kind of defense, uh, like you said, they're banged up everywhere from all on both sides of the ball. But the defense is giving up over 450 yards a game. So this is the kind of game that sets up well for the kind of offense Maryland has. Uh, this is, they need to win this game this week because the schedule does not lighten up from here on out. All right, a couple other Maryland notes. Both uh, Marcus Miner, who is the right tackle, starting right tackle, and uh, center Johnny Jordan, both are back at practice. I have not heard whether D.J. Turner is going to play or not. That's still a question mark. Other than Josh Jackson, and no new injuries, although Marcus Lewis has not been seen on the field. He's not doing as well as a knee injury. That's one of your starting corners. Uh, but back to the offensive line, 
I think Spencer Anderson and Austin Fontaine did well enough that they are going to get some run even against Purdue. Maryland needs to build depth there. If you can run off those 80-yard runs and 40-yard runs and score like they did with two redshirt freshmen out there, I think you got to keep playing those kids at least a little bit, get them in game shape. You don't know when you're going to need them. So then I want to go over to the Redskins because because we do good Redskins. It's the Tua Bowl, the un yeah. the non winners bowl between the Bengals, the Jets, the Redskins, the Dolphins. Who do you have as the as the worst of the worst here? That's a fair assessment. Uh, Coach Callahan seemed to talk uh, like he's going to do a throwback to the 80s. I expect John Riggins to show up uh, at the lead back and maybe you get some of the hogs out there. But yeah, that'd uh, be nice. I'm not sure that uh, Coach Callahan is, is in this century and in, in this era yet, but maybe against the Dolphins, if you run uh, AP or all day, and you run them all day, you might get some results. But this has not been a good running Redskin team. That's one of the problems that they've had. Do you see the run game being able to wake up under Callahan? Maybe. Um, I've always thought that the Redskins have given up on the run game early with Gruden. And I've also also questioned the, the type of runs that they've, that they've done with him. It almost seemed like when they were running the ball under Gruden, it was just, yeah, we're going to run the ball just to say we did it. But it's not really looking to get anything going there. And I think with Callahan, the one thing you will get is the continuous rest, which you mentioned with AP. That's how you get him going. He's the type of guy, yeah, you may get a lot of two-yard runs here and there, uh, but at the end of the day, at some point, that 40, that, the 40 to 55-yard touchdown run is coming. All, you, all he needs is one hole. And he hasn't looked like AP of old so far this year, uh, of course, with the with the injuries that Washington's dealing with. But I think Coach Callahan, the fact that he deals with the O-line group, he may have a little bit more of a feel to their strength. He may lean on that more. And I think his willingness to stick with the run will help uh, the offense stay on the field longer, and it will def definitely help in the play-action game, which is the best part of the Redskins' passing game. I'm Wayne Viner. That's Cordell Woodland. We will be back, talk a little more NFL, and of course some NBA international politics on this fifth episode of The Wide World of Wayne, live from the Viner Four Gates studios in Rockville. And we'd like to thank Viner Four Gates. They have had a wonderful success with many nonprofits, helping them build better websites getting them great deals from brand names like Microsoft and Google. There's a lot of free stuff out there if you're a nonprofit. Viner Forgates and their nonprofit services knows how to get the most out of your nonprofit dollar if you need a membership system, a new website, Office 365, or some new computers. Check out Viner Forgates. They can help you maximize your nonprofit dollar. You can reach Viner Forgates in Rockville at 301-251-2900 or on the web at oneviner.com. That's the numeral one, V as in victory, I-E, N as in November, E-R.com or call them at 301-251-2900. Nonprofit Services helps make your nonprofit go farther. This is Mason Viner. Listen to the Young Turfs Podcast on capitalsportsblog.com and 
TerpTalk.com, the number one rated Maryland sports podcast. And we're back here with Cordell. I'm Wayne. Thanks for listening. So, a lot of Ravens talk in that studio. The Ravens managed to beat the Steelers. The Browns managed to fall apart on national television. The Bengals are horrible. It almost doesn't matter how good the Ravens are because the rest of these teams are just falling apart. What's the Baltimore view of the AFC North? Well, I think it was thought of coming into the season. A lot of people, of course, were hiding the were, were riding the Cleveland wave because nobody really knew what to think. Uh, and there was a lot of hype surrounding that team. And then we saw as the season started, Cleveland is not exactly with what everybody thought they were going to be. Um, this turned out to be a division that's Baltimore's to lose. And you just said it. It really doesn't matter how good Baltimore is because Cincinnati is just they're, – they're pitfalling right now. Uh, Pittsburgh's got so many injuries that going on right there. It's almost impossible for them to win a game. So it really just leaves Baltimore and Cleveland. And between the two, Baltimore is the more consistent team. Uh, They have issues, but Baltimore likes to win ugly. So them winning against Pittsburgh Sunday in overtime, was that's that's a Ravens type of win. That's how they like to do it, make it gritty, ugly, especially an AFC North game. That's that's typically how it goes. So uh, I, I think Baltimore, of course, is only going to go as far as Lamar Jackson, who we saw just have his worst statistical game of his career Sunday, but they were still able to pull out a win. Um, so right now everybody is still – nobody's hitting the button for, for any reason if you're a Baltimore fan because you look at the division and you say it's yours to win. Now come late season, you're going to want a lot of the errors you're seeing the cleanup. You're going to want that secondary to start stepping up. You want to, you're going to want to start getting a more consistent pass rush. And I think the Lamar Jackson to Marquise Brown connection, hopefully, as the season goes on, will get a little bit uh, more crisp. That, that's pretty good stuff there on the Ravens. I want to switch back to the Redskins before we go NBA. If you could lose every game this year or finish 1-15 and 15, uh, to get the first pick, is it worth going 1-15 and 15 to get Tua or to get the package to trade it? Or if you want to chase Young, the defensive end from Ohio State, do you think it's worth it to be this bad? Well, at some point you have to. Uh, if we're talking about the Redskins, this has been a team that's been known over the years as the definition of mediocrity. They, as bad as they've been, they've always been able to hang around the the 500 mark. So they're typically in the middle of the order when it comes to draft time. Outside of the year where they traded up to get RG3, uh, they typically haven't had high first-round picks. So at some point they have to because they've been stuck. We've been stuck in the same spot for too long. So lose this year could be a blessing in disguise. And the good part is you may not have to try to lose these games on purpose. Your team just may be bad enough to where you'll go out there and actually try to compete, but you'll just lose. Right. And that's the best case situ- situation for the Redskins. They need as many playmakers on this team as possible because it's obvious the front office is doing a lot of swings and misses when it comes to free agency, get bringing in veteran guys, and the lack of trade. So the draft has been the biggest part of the – the most successful part, I should say, uh, of the team when it comes to team building. Um, so they need to continue. But they, they're, they're lacking the dynamic players, the one-of-a-kind players. And the only way to really get the best way, I should say, to get them is try to get them at the top of the order. So I, it could pay off. I understand – what you're saying, but every time I hear that, I have to bring up the fact that the tailback that they spent a high draft pick on, Darius Geis, is out for the year. The the top draft pick from last year, or the second pick from last year, which is uh, Love from Stanford, another tailback, is out for the year. The all-pro left tackle that they're paying a fortune to decided he's not going to play. The all-pro level right guard is injured and he's out. The $30 million a year quarterback that they still paying will never play again. 
the tight end that's making a hell of a lot of money and should be the best player on this team possibly, which is Jordan Reed, is probably never going to play again. It's might not be that they aren't there, but those five or six players are better than anybody that's playing right now. And if they had them all back, Bill Callahan could look uh, pretty good, but they're not coming back. So hopefully they will find a way to trade Trent and get that cap money back. They're going to have to get a financial deal with Alex Smith and get that cap money off of there. They're going to have to figure out if they want to keep investing in a guy like Brandon Scherf, if they're going to be bad anyhow, how much money do you tie up in a right guard? They're going to have to get rid of Jordan Reed and probably Vernon Davis, and and that cap money is going to have to go. I don't know how long it's going to take to burn that money off, but before they really become competitive again, they're going to have to get some financial house cleaning in order in order to go out and get those free agents. But since the whole world revolves, oh sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Now, I was just going to say the good thing is they do have a solid amount of cap uh, going into this next year. Now, granted, that's before they re-sign Brandon Sheriff. Uh, but assuming that they could somehow find a way to get out of that Alex Smith deal, which for the record I was against from day one before the injury, um, if they could find a way to get out of that, they would have a little bit more room to wiggle with. But the common thing I heard from you was injuries and if we can't avoid the injury bug, it doesn't matter who we get on this team. We'll, we'll never reach the peak. Nope, but, you know, hope springs eternal. And, boy, I hope Danny Snyder sells this team. That's my hope. Um, and moving on, because business makes the world go round, I haven't heard every detail, because the details just really aren't out there, but Daryl Morey, who is the general manager of, I think he still is today, but if he, if they let him go any minute, it wouldn't surprise me. General manager of the Houston Rockets sent out what I think is an innocuous tweet supporting the protesters who want a free Hong Kong. The Chinese government had an absolute international fit. I thought the NBA would tell them to go screw off because this is America, and you can say what you want to say. Apparently not. Um, the NBA has backed the communist Chinese government line. Nike has pulled all the Houston Rockets merchandise out of the stores in China. The Houston Rockets were the number one NBA team in China. Uh, they have, people are painting over the logos. Um, apparently you cannot criticize the communist government or you will disappear. I cannot believe that this is what's going on. It, it, it hurts me as what I thought was a freedom-loving American. Um, the Wizards were going to sell us a 10-game pack. I was talking to Bruce, who's my radio partner on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. I can tell you that unless I get a better explanation of what happened, I'm never going back. If they want to back the communist Chinese they can get their money from somebody else. I'm not helping. But Cordell, go ahead. Well, I don't, I, I think as I'm reading up on it a little bit, it looks like they're actually supporting the team a little bit uh, because recently from the game yesterday, uh, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, um, Adam Silvers did say that he was apologetic for the reaction that followed the treat, but he, don't, but he did say that he is not apologizing for Daryl Moore exercising his freedom of expression. So last night at the Lakers and Nets game out there, apparently there was a question that was asked to the, I'm sorry, the Rockets-Raptors game last night in Tokyo. There was a question asked to Harden and Westbrook about the situation in China. But the Rockets PR told the reporter that they weren't taking any of those questions. And today it looks like Adam Silver is saying that he's upset that the Rockets PR denied the reporter the question. So it, it seems like to be, because the NBA, as we know, they, they're pretty loose, you know, when it comes to being vocal about social issues. And in general, Adam Silver is pretty progressive, probably the most progressive commissioner I've seen in sports in at least a long time in my lifetime. Uh, so it definitely shocked me a little bit That's, uh, when, when, I, when the story initially came out because I didn't know what was all going on. I, I saw what Daryl Morey said. 
uh, and I saw the reaction from China, but I didn't know how the NBA was reacting. But it looks like the NBA is trying to stick to their guns and saying that just how you know that we live, we come from a free country, so he they are allowed to say you know what's on their mind. And I hope that they come out a little stronger against that. I know if they do, they're risking a relationship, a loss with China. Now, I doubt that right. China is going to decide they're going to become NHL fans over this. Right. But I'm not, I mean, the world's made up of different people. And uh, unfortunately, we don't all get along all the time. But th this one, this one really bothers me. And on that note, I want to thank Cordell for joining in. We will be back. I don't know if Cordell is coming in on Saturday. I can ask him right now. Are you going to come in and run the board for the Sports Maven on Saturday? Yeah, I believe I actually am there on Saturday. Well, this will be great. We'll do this again with Bruce Posner on 1300 CBS Sports Radio in Baltimore when Coons Ford will present the Sports Maven, and that will be before uh, Maryland Purdue. That'll be at nine o'clock on Saturday, and then at ten o'clock on Saturday, because it's an NFL London game on Sunday. You will be able to hear in the nest, and that's Bruce Posner and the guys from Science and Kirk uh, will be on at ten o'clock on thirteen hundred CBS Sports Radio, previewing the Ravens and the god awful Bengals. We'll see how that goes, and of course Cordell and I will be back on the Wide World of Wayne early next week, probably a Tuesday nighter. Uh, talking about the Maryland-Purdue game and the Tua Bowl between the Dolphins and the Redskins. Cordell, thanks for coming in. And that no will problem. do it. Thanks for having me. That'll do it for the fifth episode. And as always, thanks for listening.